This is part four on Second Thessalonians chapter one, verses one through four. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, to the church, the assembly, the congregation, the gathering, that word doesn't carry any particular spiritual implication in the word itself. It gets its riches from the following words. What kind of gathering? The the gathering of, of people in Thessalonica in God our Father and in, so this in modifies both of these, and in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's this connection with God as Father and Jesus Christ as Lord that gives the people, us Christians, our significance. So, Father, as we ponder the significance of what it is to be in God as our Father and in Jesus as our Lord, show us the glories of who they are and what it is to be connected to them in this way as your church. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Notice one difference. Actually, there are two significant differences between the first verse of First Thessalonians and the first verse of Second Thessalonians. Here's First Thessalonians. Paul, Silvanus, Timothy, identical so far to the church of the Thessalonians, identical so far in God, identical so far, but here it's the Father, and in Second Thessalonians it's our Father. You see this here? In God, our Father, and then, and the Lord Jesus Christ, identical. And then, grace to you in peace, identical, stop. That's all he said in First Thessalonians, and here in Second Thessalonians he says, grace to you in peace, and he repeats the very titles that he just gave here, from God our Father, same as here, and the Lord Jesus Christ, same as here. Seems very repetitive, doesn't it? So, I'm writing to you Thessalonians, uh, in God the Father, our Father, and the Lord Jesus. That's who you are. That's who the church is. And now I'm, I'm calling down grace and peace upon you from that very God, the Father, and that very Lord Jesus Christ. So I'm guessing that the addition of our here is drawing attention to the preciousness, not just that God is a divine Father in the Trinity in relationship to Jesus Christ as Lord, but he is our Father by virtue of being in him. And we'll see that in just a moment, what, what that involves. And the fact that he felt obliged to add that and, and thus make it more uh, personal and more intimate and more perhaps helpful and protective of the situation that they're in, he then was led to um, repeat it here with the hour. At least when I see something repeated like that, I want to say, hmm, let's pause here and ponder a little longer what we're looking at. So let's think for just a moment what it is to be uh, Jesus Christ as Lord and God as, and God as Father. Here's a passage from Philippians 2 to wake us up about the meaning of the word Lord when applied to Jesus. Therefore God has highly exalted him, Christ, and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Now what makes this striking? is that this is a quote 
more or less from Isaiah 45.23, where God says, By myself I have sworn, from my mouth has gone out in righteousness a word that shall not return to me. Every knee shall bow. Every, where is it? There it is. Every knee should bow, and every tongue here shall swear allegiance. This word from God about God is now applied to Jesus as Lord, and that word Lord is regularly used. That kurios word is regularly used in the Old Testament to translate Yahweh, the God of Isaiah 45 and the rest of the Old Testament. So this is a very bold statement that, no, every tongue, every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess, not just that God the Father is Lord, but that Jesus is Lord, and it will redound to the glory of God the Father, which implies that Jesus is divine, which is exactly what Paul says explicitly in Colossians 1 and 2. In Christ, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Or again in chapter 2, verse 9, for in him, in Christ, the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. So, contrary to what many sects say and what some liberals say, the Bible teaches that Jesus Christ is a God-man, a man-God. He, he was human, fully human, and he was fully God. So, when Paul says, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God, we are to be amazed that because of our union with Christ, God is our Father, and we are to am be amazed that we are in, in some sense, in the Lord, that is, the divine God-man, Jesus Christ. Now, what then does this in refer to? And, and I think the best way to answer that is just to to go to a place in 2 Thessalonians itself and read it with that question in mind. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to close by looking at this passage from chapter 2, stretching into chapter 3, verse 5. So let's read it, asking, all right, Paul, give us some hint what you mean that the church, the people of Christ, the people of God, are in God as their Father, in Jesus. As their Lord. What do you what do you mean? What's the meaning of in? We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, beloved by the Lord. That's the first thing I'm going to say. It to be in God is to be in his love. In his love. Because God chose you. That's the second thing I'm going to say. To be in God or in the Lord is to be in his choice, in his election, in his selection as the first fruits to be saved. It means to be in his salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. To this he called you. It's to be in the, the capturing of his call. He called us. He loved us. He chose us. He saved us. He called us. So the, the in word back there is in all this reality. If you're in God, you're in his love. In God, you're in his election. In God, you're in his salvation. In God, you're in his calling. He called you through the gospel so that you may obtain the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. You obtain divine glory. So we are in the glory, it becomes ours. We shine with the very radiance of the glory of Christ in the age to come. Jesus said, the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. We are in his radiance. Now may our Lord Jesus 
Christ himself and God our Father. So now he's drawing attention to those very two from chapter 1, verse 1. Lord Jesus and God our Father, may those two working together who loved us, underlining the love, and gave us eternal comfort and good hope. We are in his comfort, in his hope, through grace, comfort your hearts and establish them. He establishes us. We are in his commitment to establish us in every good work. But the Lord is faithful. He will establish you. So we are in his establishing commitment. He's going to do it. We are in his covenant commitment to establish us and guard us. May the Lord direct your hearts. We are in the sway of his sovereign direction. So all of that, I would say, is the immediate context of 2 Thessalonians illumining the glories of this word in. To be the church, whether you're in Thessalonica or here with me in Minneapolis or anywhere in the world, if you are Christ's part of his people, then you are in God as your Father, and you are in Jesus Christ as your Lord, and the implications of that are to be loved, to be chosen, to be saved, to be called, to have his glory, to be in his comfort and his hope and his commitment to establish you, and in the sway of the direction of your heart. It is a spectacular and immeasurably great thing to be in God.